Lecture number 14. And now, in our today's lesson, excuse me, 1656 in Lectures on Faith. Well, uh, that's why they don't publish the Lectures on Faith anymore in the church. They were uh, lectures that were kind of, you know, under pressure and uh, lots of research has been done since then. That was the best they had at the time, but it was way too fast. That's not the gospel doctrine. The Lectures on Faith are not to be taken as doctrine. There are lots of mistakes in them. Okay? Yeah, just kind of keep that in mind. When you, I mean, it's just like, um, for example, when I give my talks to you, I reserve the right to change anything. Uh, as of this morning, this is my best thinking, and I'm studying like you are. If I find out anything better, I'm going to change it and, and share it with you, right? That's what the brethren are doing, the lectures on faith. And the prophet uh, gained a tremendous amount of insight after some of the things that were put in the lectures on faith. So... Uh, that's why they're not published anymore by the church. Now, in today's lesson, we have quite a bit uh, uh, of information about riches. About riches. And the finest doctrine in all church literature is in the writings of Jacob on riches. Now, we feel very uh, uncomfortable when we're well off. And other people aren't so well off. In, in the stratified structure of... Uh, uh, Europe of the past, uh, it was considered to be perfectly all right if you belonged to the upper class. And the lower class kind of assumed that the upper class was supposed to be rich and they were supposed to be poor. That's not the American approach. It's not the gospel approach. We have to figure out a way to profitably help those who are in need and who don't have equal opportunity. Therefore, the question arises, is it a, le a legitimate function of government? The government has experimented and experimented trying to find out if it can cure poverty. And so the Freeman Report this week is, we've now had several years of OEO. Should it be abolished? And here are the people who say yes on this page, eight pages of it. Yes, and then these people say no, the government has a place in poverty. Yes and no. Now, the church has a policy on this, hasn't it? It actually has a doctrine on this subject. But for those of you who are interested, I, I was able to get a few copies. I go down and exercise my uh, prerogatives as president of the Freeman Institute to pick up a few each time. And uh, for those of you who are interested, there it is, pro and con. Just to give you an educated opinion so that you have some idea of what the problems are both sides. Definitely something needs to be done about poverty. The question is, what's the best way? What's the best way? And I've been up and down this, the ladder two or three times, one side and then the other. And uh, I know I, I have compassion for the poor. I've been one of them many years of my life. And um, there have been periods of good fortune when uh, I was able to do good and, and help the poor sometimes. So, uh, and I've watched what's effective and what's very, very destructive to human dignity and character. So anyway, that's the reason we put out OEO. It's not to say we're against helping the poor. It's, just, it's simply saying, what's the best way, and is the government a good way? Or is that ineffective? When uh, the Secretary uh, of uh, Labor came out to Utah a year and a half ago, he went through Welfare Square, and he sat down for almost three days with the presiding bishopric. And he said, if we had just had the insight from the beginning, before we spoiled people, to take this approach to helping the poor, we would have saved billions. And we wouldn't have people hating the government like they now do, because it doesn't give them more. And so the church authorities said, well, there's no time like the present, you know, to start changing. But it's awfully hard politically to change once you've started giving bread and circuses. Even when you have a good feeling in your heart when you're doing it for their own good. There's a corrupting influence. Well, that's the problems of the Book of Mormon applied to our day. That's what I was trying to do with the Freeman Institute, to bring alive gospel principles and concepts in terms of current issues so that we don't dictate to anybody what they should think or believe, but just give them the information so they at least have an intelligent opinion and aren't propagandized and brainwashed by current headlines. Now, this 
Jacob turns out to be a, a sweet spirit. And of all his brothers, this is the one Nephi loved the most. He had him give sermons in his behalf. He had him explain things from the creation. This man was not only eloquent of tongue, which Nephi was also, but this man was what in writing? Do you notice the difference in style and writing? As he starts talking about, he said, you women, you, you people here who are innocent, you came to be inspired at this conference at the temple. And he said, what I'm going to tell you today will be like daggers in your heart. You remember? So that's Jacob. And Nephi would never do that. He has no similes and he doesn't go for metaphors and so. But Jacob, he knows what daggers in the heart are like. So it's, he's a great person. Now he's going to live at least 100 years. We think he was born about two years after they got out into the wilderness. Um, we're guessing. Uh, but he was uh, the first of the children born out in the wilderness, so we think it's about 598 B.C. And um, uh, so he's about 18 years younger than Nephi. And when he's 54 years of age, after having been a loyal and faithful follower of Nephi and having done a lot of the work with Nephi, he finally is given the records. Now, his brother, you see, is around 72 years of age. Nephi is now an old man when he gives him the records. And... Um, Nephi has some instructions. He says, now, when you write in these small plates, my brother Jacob, when you write in them, I want you to just put in certain things. And if I were you, I'd remember what those certain things were. This record is not, oh, it has a little history in it, but not nearly as much history as it has some other things. What are they? Write in prophecy, revelations. What kind of sermons? What? Yeah, the good sermons. Put in the good sermons. Oh, some sermons are so boring. They are, and sometimes, um, for example, see, you, none of you ever had a chance to hear J. Reuben Clark. But he reads well. But he was very difficult to listen to because he was a lawyer. And every word was so important. <laughs> it was hard to listen. His sermons are tremendous. They're almost classical scripture now. But he spoke often right out of the heart. But that slowly. And every word, his brain was taking that word and wringing it out and spreading it out, wringing it out again. Let's see, is that the right word? So he said precisely what he meant. J. Reuben Clark. Now, some others are much more colorful, but when it's all through, all you've heard is a three bear story, right? <laughs> really wasn't profound. It wasn't, it was kind of a light, it was entertaining, but it uh, wasn't really a great sermon. But it was good amongst all the others to kind of lighten things up, maybe. Served its purpose. Put in the good sermons. Now, in connection with this, we have a reference to the cross. At this early stage of Nephite history, there was a constant struggle to keep the people from coming out in open defiance against God. Jacob therefore said, we would to God it were possible to persuade all men, even the Lamanites, isn't that interesting, to believe in Christ and seriously consider the significance of his death and suffer his cross and bear the shame of, scorn, of a scornful world so that the gospel of Jesus Christ could be spread among men. Now, early critics of the Book of Mormon said, oh, oh, Joseph Smith flubbed it. He got the cross in there about 600 years too early, or 450 years too early. That was a Roman method of um, death. Nobody else used it. Were they historically right? Yes. Were they prophetically right? No. Adam knew it. Enoch knew it. Noah knew it. All the ancient prophets knew that Jesus would be crucified on a cross. And now we're finding out with the Dead Sea Scrolls and everything that hundreds of years before Jesus Christ, the cross represented the atoning sacrifice. The cross. And of course it became then the symbol of the Christian church uh, afterwards. In fact, the Catholic fathers carried the cross around the world. See, that became the symbol. It was the symbol before Jesus Christ also. And the Book of Mormon mentioned, the Book of Mormon turns out once again to be right. Not once have they proven it wrong with the passing of time. Always the Book of Mormon comes out to be correct. That's why it's a book for all the world, not just for Mormons, to prove that Jesus is the Christ. Now, Nephi, as he prepared to die, gave the kingdom to whom? 
Who did he give the kingdom to? Give the kingdom to Jacob? Who did he give it to? His son, what was his name? We don't know what he was born, but they called him once he became king, Nephi the second. Nephi the second, then they'd have Nephi the third, Nephi the fourth, Nephi the fifth. Now what about the book of Nephi the second, which is going to be clear over um, near the time of Christ? Why well, have we got a Nephi the second, which is a book, when Nephi the second, the king, is way back here around 550 B.C.? Are they the same person? Obviously not. Then what's Nephi the second? Any ideas? Good. Yeah, the second Nephi as a prophet is Nephi the second. So he's, a, he's way, way down. He's not a king. So they had nearly 500 years of kings all called Nephi. Nephi the 28th. Nephi the 22nd. Nothing in this book about those Nephi's. Not a thing. When we hit Nephi the second, we're talking about the second great Nephi who was a prophet of God. Everybody got that clear? All right. Who got the big plates with all the history in them? Who's going to write that? Nephi the second, the king. Who got the little place to contain all the beautiful things about the scriptures? Jacob. Everybody got that straight now? The lineage of the gospel and the pres presidency of the church is going to go down through Jacob now. Politically, it's going to go down through Nephi and his people. Everybody got that straight? All right. Politically, down through Nephi. Spiritually, down through Jacob. Lo and behold, it's going to come together here down a few few generations. They're going to come together again in a direct descent of Nephi. Jacob's people will be kind of wiped out. Uh, the second book of Nephi? Yes. The, the, the book of second Nephi. That's the writings of Nephi. But now, maybe I confused you. Um, we're going to come to another uh, Nephi, way, way down the trail at the time of Christ. We call him Nephi the second. This was the book of Nephi, the second book of Nephi. Now, I've really said this wrong now, because I... Um, we have uh, Nephi 1, and he wrote two books, didn't he? All right. <laughs> He took a look at the, the book of Nephi and second Nephi, two books. Okay, then we're going to get clear down in the writings of Helaman, where we come to another Nephi, and he's going to prepare the Nephites for the coming of Christ. And that's going to be Nephi the second. Then he's translated, and his son becomes the president of the church the year that Christ is born in Bethlehem. And that turns out to be Nephi the third. And after Christ has visited the Nephites, Nephi the third is translated and apparently became one of the three Nephites, so far as we're able to tell, and there's a lot of evidence that was the case. And his son, Nephi the fourth, and it's called, his book is called Nephi the fourth, isn't it? Right. And we have Nephi the third, Nephi the fourth. Just remember uh, not to confuse these Nephites with the political leaders. That's all I was trying to say. I'm so, I said it badly. Thank you, Johnny. Getting me straightened out there. Now, yes. No, uh, we're not going to hear about the political leaders at all. Any Nephites that you hear from here on are all prophets. We'll never cross the path of a, of a King Nephi again in the whole book. I'll just say, and the king, and the king, and the king, and the king. All right? Now, Jacob says that he's, going to, he's not going to divide the people into uh, Samuelites and Lemuelites and Ishmaelites. If they're for Nephi and for the gospel and the kingdom of God, they're called what? No matter whether they're brown or white or blue-eyed or brown-eyed, if they're against what the prophets of God are doing, what are they called? No matter whether they're Nephites or Lamanites or Lemuelites. Now that's going to be more or less the picture all the way through. Now Jacob says, I and Joseph were ordained to be teachers and priests. Now this is not referring to their rank in the priesthood. See, we have teachers and priests in the priesthood. These people are Melchizedek priesthood holders who have the assignment to teach the gospel just as we do here at BYU or just as we do when we go on missions. Teach the gospel. And then there were those who were to be the priests to perform the ordinances. And they could be 70s or elders or high priests or whatever. That, has not, that does not refer to um, the rank in the priesthood because the Lord in the Doctrine and Covenants says the same thing. And I've sent you forth as teachers and priests unto the people. And here they were all uh, elders and apostles and seventies. Do you follow that now? That is not referring to rank in the priesthood. All right? Now Jacob and Joseph say, we take our assignment very seriously, extremely seriously. Uh, we feel that if we don't warn people and help them, then they're, 
their blood is on our skirts. In other words, when they suffer in the next world and we could have gotten them up off the ground and gotten them going and we didn't do it, we'll feel guilty for that. So we take our calling very seriously. Now I notice that some of our elders do and some of them don't. Some go to sleep, uh, some don't go to their meetings, some are not responsive, and others are just gung-ho. And when I've presided over, when I've served in bishoprics and I presently serve in a high council, it's so thrilling to pick up a phone and say, Brother Jones, we, we need some help with the young adults. I wonder if I could get you to take four Sundays for them. You're about their age. They'll identify with you. Would you mind doing that so we can get this young adult program really going? Share with them some of the wonderful things that you experienced while you were in Germany on a mission, etc. And he says, Oh, fine, Brother Scouse, and thank you for calling me. I, gee, that's so nice of you to think of me. Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, I'll tell you, that does something for you when you're in a leadership position. Then you have the others say, well, um, let's see, I've got this, and i got that, and i I got that. I, yeah, I sure wish. Have you thought of Brother So-and-so? He's great. Yes, I've thought of Brother So-and-so. And he would have done it, only his wife is dying of cancer. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Well, have you thought of So-and-so? Yes. But more importantly, I thought of you. Is your answer yes or no? Oh, well, if you insist. No, I'm not insisting. It's up to you. You have a calling. You want to respond or not? Now, when some of you get to be bishops, you'll know what I'm talking about. All right, uh, Jacob says now, I, um, <clears throat> I said, I have an errand from the Lord. I want all of you to meet at the temple. Would they meet inside the temple or the outside? In the courtyard of the temple. You got that straight? I see you should have all these answers in your mind. I want you to study this. So when I want to ask you these questions. You come up. All my other classes do. So I want you to be more, more aggressive now in, in getting this material. Make it yours. Uh, get this down until you can just respond as a class. You automatically know the answers. Then this book is becoming yours. Otherwise, you're just reading it like any other book and you'll forget it. All right? So they met in the courtyard of the temple. The temple is very tiny. You see, it's only uh, 90 feet long and... The, the main place inside is only 30 feet. has a little altar of incense and an altar of shoe bread. The big altar where the sacrifices are is outside the temple. They just have incense inside the temple. So they meet on the outside in the great courtyards around the temple. And we hope they had good weather all the time, but that's where they met. Now he said, uh, Jacob said, I have my message from God. And he said, since Nephi died and Nephi the second has taken over. We've been having some problems here among you people. In the first place, you've gotten remarkably wealthy. There was nothing wrong with that except what did it do to the people? It divided them into classes so that they had pride if they had more riches than the other fellow. Well, I've gone out uh, prospecting and one fellow who has got an IQ of 70 accidentally stumbles onto a pane of gold. And uh, you don't know whether that makes him greater or not. One of your most brilliant intellects, he's out there pegging away too and studied geology and everything, but just didn't quite to happen to poke into the right corner. And yet here's a person who uh, far advanced maybe of the one who discovered the gold, and the one who's discovered the gold says, of course, I'm, <laughs> I did it. I'm bigger and bigger, I'm better than they are, and so forth. And the first thing you know, he's looking down on everybody else. And Jacob says, your accumulation of gold is no criteria. So what say ye of it? Now he said, I want you to remember that men are only of dust, and my, I want you to remember what a miracle is. You see that hand? That's made of dirt. Now if you want to appreciate the miracle of God's creative power. I just want you to think of your hand. That is made of dirt. And so is your eye. Your teeth and your tongue, they're all made of dirt. And if I had some ordinary soil here and just poured it like this, it's no different than that hand, except this has been organized by the power of God into an instrument which will play a piano, not very well, but or a, a guitar, will type, write, point, perform surgery, that's made of dirt. Now you just stop and think about the miracle of the human body. The Lord says, your body's my temple. I organize. It isn't yours. I just 
gave it to you, but don't defile it. It's mine. It's made of dirt, and it'll go back to dirt, but I'll bring it out and make it resurrected one day, and it'll be totally obedient to you. But Jacob makes a point of this. You are the dust of the earth. And um, he said, now I wish I only had to criticize you about riches. But he said, I want, you, well, I want to tell you something about riches, and remember this because it's in the examination, nearly all my examinations, his criteria for riches. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Make your commitments that you're going to do good with everything that comes into your possession. And then if you seek riches, seek them for what purpose? With which to do good. Will you remember that? Then seek riches with which to do good. S seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then seek ye riches with which to do good. Now, a lot of people think that becoming wealthy is an evil. I want to tell you that the only reason you're in this school is because people shared of their abundance. Seventy percent of your... Uh, expenses being at this school is because some people are pouring in literally millions every year into the church it's only their tithing but when you're operating with millions I tell you two million dollars seems like an awful lot and you could build a new factory with it now I, I watch people um, uh, what should we say they're, they're very critical of those who who've accumulated something you take a man like brother Marriott see I grew up with brother Marriott I watched him start out with a hole in the wall and serve hot dogs and, and, uh, and nice thick malted milks, which nobody in Washington had ever tasted unless they came from the West. The next thing I knew, um, he had a line a half a block long. He went across the bank and he said, uh, would you look over there? I think I got something. Yeah, the banker says, you must have. He said, I'd like you to borrow a little money, please. If I know it's a depression and everything, but I'd like to borrow a little money, have a, a little root beer stand maybe. So out on Connecticut Avenue, they financed him for a little root beer stand. Pretty soon he came back and he said, uh, I'm sorry, I can't accommodate the crowds. You think I ought to have another little root beer stand, maybe on the other side? Well, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I guess so. We, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And so I give him another little root beer stand. The world, one of the world's largest restaurant owners today. Hotels. And so we got the Marriott Center, a million dollars here. University of Utah, a million dollars there. Hundreds and hundreds of students here a result of, of the millions that uh, Brother Marriott's accumulated. He's done it all to do good. He only has, he only bathes in one bathtub and rides in one car and sleeps in one bed and wears one suit of clothes at a time and so forth. He was our stake president in Washington. He's not ostentatious. He has no priggish uh, pride about him. Sweet spirit. Real sweet spirit. And constantly anxious to do good. But I'll tell you, he's a good businessman. And uh, I walked through uh, the hot shop in Washington one day. It was a Sunday afternoon. And we had to go to a meeting together. He said, excuse me, Brother Scouse. In fact, he said, come out of the car with me. We're on a meeting. He walked through the kitchen. Here's a tub of mixed salad, mixed salad. And Brother Marriott walked over to that and took a hold of the corner of the tub and dumped it right on the floor. The managers turned around and, in amazement and he said, don't you ever serve our people wilted lettuce again. I'm sure that manager never forgot it. Don't you serve our people wilted lettuce. <laughs> Nothing but the best for our people and the prices were cheap but one to two percent profit on each dollar, that's all. Not 20 cents or 40 cents like in furniture. One to two cents on food investments. But he's a good manager. Now, seek ye first the kingdom of God. He did that. Then seek riches with which to do good. And he accumulated them so that he gave thousands and thousands of jobs to people around the, around the world now as it's turning out. All right, now Lehi said, I wish I only had to criticize you for this one thing, which is uh, being proud of your riches. But now, he said, I have to tell you about something more serious. And he said, I must say to you sweet wives and and uh, wonderful people, you young people who've come here to be inspired of me, I have a different message and it's not for you. I'm sorry, but I have a task to perform and I hate it, but I'm going to do it. I have to talk to some of the men who are here and some of the women who are here who are living licentious lives and it is an abomination in the eyes of God. And so he really went after them for immorality and having plural marriage when God hadn't authorized it. Now, God says, when I do authorize it, and I want you to remember, the only time that it's authorized is to what? Raise up seed unto me. 
And if I haven't commanded it, the rule is each man shall have one wife and concubines, he shall have none. And um, we have quite a few of our people because in our early days of the church we were commanded to practice this principle. Both of my grandparents did, tried to live it righteously. And when the Lord said, now it must not be done anymore, you can see what Lucifer has used this one principle to do, hedge up the whole church and stop us from performing any of our good services. And so, President Woodruff, uh, I just want you to see what he's done. And I want, you to, I want to ask you, are you reconciled now to making the necessary adjustment so we can plow around? Brother Woodruff said, well, uh, yes, if you're willing, I'm willing. The Lord said, all right, let's go forward. Ask the saints to support us, and some of the saints didn't support the First Presidency. Called President Woodruff a fallen prophet, said this was an eternal principle, which of course it is. But using it at one time or another is the Lord's business, not ours. I'm awfully glad I'm not asked to live it. It isn't easy. It's awfully hard to live. But great fruits come from it in the, uh, the blessings of the Lord. Those, those families that lived it right... Um, as I go back and look at the families of my grandparents and where they went and what they accomplished, it was amazing. And they raised them in poverty. You'd never know it today. They all did well, with one exception. Out of 23 children on my mother's side, they all did well. But now will you remember that in your book, if you want to, remember, if you want to quote to somebody what Wilford Woodruff said about the, the um, manifesto, it's in your volume too at the end of chapter 2. you remember that? Because you're going to be looking for that one of these days. And that's, that's your answer. It's right at the end of that volume 2. Now he goes on with um, his sermon. He says this about the Lamanites. He said, now you, you criticize the Lamanites because of their dark skin, you Nephites. He said, I want to tell you that in many ways their spirits are whiter than yours. It's true, God did curse them with the dark skin. He did it one generation. <clears throat> we saw them go from a white and delightsome people to a dark-skinned people. But that was for a purpose. That doesn't mean that dark skin is a curse necessarily. It means that if they apostatize, they are uh, cursed and separated from the people. Nevertheless, he said, God loves them at least because they're true to their families. And he said, that's more than I can say for you apostate Nephites. Now he says, I want you to arouse your faculties and... Uh, Remember who you are and the assignment that you have. And now this is the end of Jacob's writings. For years and years, Jacob never wrote another word. Only when he was an old man does he pick up the stylus and start chapter 4, 5, and 6. And when he picks up the stylus again with chapter 4, many years later, he said, I want to tell you this Egyptian is hard to write. Well, Nephi just wrote and wrote and wrote. He did all those magnificent big plates of Nephi. He did all of this material in first and second Nephi. And uh, Jacob says, I want to tell you, it's hard to write this Egyptian. And he didn't write much. Like Nephi said, he would have included a lot of Jacob's sermons, but he didn't have time. Now Jacob doesn't include many of his own sermons. He got that one. But this fourth chapter is magnificent. And I want you to remember, uh, remember it. I just, I left my scriptures sitting on the table. Can I borrow your Book of Mormon just a second? I want you to just notice something here in this chapter. You see, he says something here which isn't being done in the church even today. He just wants us to get up and get going. Uh, fourth chapter. He says, um, do you know how God created the earth? And the average Latter-day Saint doesn't know. He did it by talking to the intelligences and telling them to organize. By the word of his power he created the earth and he spoke and it came into existence. It didn't come like that. But everything was done gradually. But it was done in accordance with a pattern of speaking to the intelligences in matter. Now this doctrine got lost in the church. We're trying to revive it because that chapter doesn't mean anything to the average Latter-day Saint. And he says... Um, he comes down here and he says, why do you revile, let me see if I can put my finger right on it, the revelations of God. He says, seek not to counsel the Lord, but take counsel from his hands. There's a little passage right here closely, which right here near, which says that we're guilty of, of actually um, reviling the revelations of God. Despise not the revelations of God, verse 8. 
and no man knoweth of his ways, save it be revealed unto him. Wherefore, brethren, despise not the revelations of God. Now go over to chapter 12, or verse 12. He says, Now, my beloved, marvel not that I tell you these things, for why not speak of the atonement of Christ, and attain to a perfect knowledge of him? And just the other day, someone did this. You see, the Latter-day said, you ask him why the atonement works. When Jesus suffers on the cross, what does that satisfy? Who does that uh, make happy? Yeah, the Father certainly didn't want that. That's got to be such a terrible suffering that the intelligence say, well, all right, if it means that much to you. And they're all out there in the universe. Now, if you don't understand that, it's impossible to understand the necessity for the atonement. Nor can you understand in... Um, Alma 42, why God says, if I were not just, I would cease to be God. Now, that certainly was a blasphemous statement to, to make why people who believe in the platonic concept of God, he's the first great cause that created everything out of nothing. God can't cease to be God. God says, I can cease to be God. He said, you don't understand anything about God, and if you don't understand that I have to be perfect, I have to be immaculate, I can't look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. That's why we had to have an atoning sacrifice. And we've got a whole church ignorant of this doctrine. And Jacob says, why not talk about the atonement and have a perfect understanding of this wonderful person of Christ? This is how you learn to love Christ and appreciate the Father. Understand that doctrine. And it's in this Book of Mormon. And um, a friend of mine spoke of it recently in a group of uh, missionaries. And the person in charge immediately rose up and said, Oh, let, let, let's, let's, let's not talk about the mysteries. And when I heard about it, I thought of this. Wherefore despise not the revelations of God? Why is it a mystery? Because, sir, you are presiding over a congregation that you're supposed to teach, and you yourself don't recognize the truth when a servant of God teaches it. And you're reviling the revelations of God, sir, even though you preside over this congregation. You would say it in respect, but this is one place where I get a little uncharitable because my, re my generation was guilty of this. And I don't like to see any of your generation guilty of it. Welcome the revelations of God. If there's anything in the scripture you don't understand, then say to yourself, no, I'm going to try and understand it. I'm going to pray to my Heavenly Father. I'm going to study hard. See if I can understand that. Jacob says, why not talk about the atonement? Why not come to a perfect understanding of Christ? Why call it a mystery when this book says there was an absolute necessity for the atonement and this is why there was a necessity? It's all in this book. So uh, this is a great chapter. Revile not the revelations of God. Now, uh, Jacob hopes his descendants will appreciate their ancestors. He said, we want them to know that we knew about Christ, that we received revelations, that we had the power of the priesthood, we could command the waves of the sea, we could stop the winds, we could move mountains by the command of the priesthood. They obey, these elements obeyed us because of the intelligence in them, and God had authorized us to do these things. I said, we'd just like you to know a few little things about us. He's very humble, you notice, as he get toward the end of his book. He said, we've lived very lonesome, difficult lives. We took the gospel of the Lamanites. They rejected it. They're not going to accept it for about 450 years. Then a few of them will start coming in. But prophet after prophet is going to take the gospel of the Lamanites and just about get killed. Now, I put here... Now, somebody's going to ask you sometime, what about this intelligence business? Never heard of that doctrine before. And you spin over here to chapter 4 of Jacob, where he talks about, it's on page 18. Uh, let's see, no, I don't have the new book. I've got the old one here. Anyway, it's verse uh, 6. And you've got a quotation there from Brigham Young, and it's just one of scores of, of uh, early brethren talking about the intelligences in matter. And here at this late date, along comes Dr. Milliken of Caltech, along come Dr. Bergson, and um, this, uh, the other day here we, uh, uh, you were kind enough to give me this article, it's tremendously interesting, scientists being able to say, obviously, there is finite intelligence down there in the molecules. They fool around, they don't... They, they show exercise independent capacity well see we've, we've had this for a hundred and some odd years we didn't teach it don't you think the Lord's unhappy with us for that bet he is people say I wish we get some more revelations we, okay just open the book and start reading it'll reveal all kinds of things to you 
And then um, seek not to counsel God, but receive counsel from him that I just read. And notice that everything is done by the power of my word. And he says in the 29th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, it is the honor which the intelligences give me that gives me the power so that when I speak, they obey. When I speak, they obey. Once you understand this, the miracles make sense, the organization of the earth makes sense, your scriptures come alive. Now, we come to the parable of the olive tree. Actually, this, because this is the longest parable, or the longest chapter in the Book of Mormon, it is tedious reading unless you know what it's talking about. So I tried to bring it alive a little bit for you. I hope it helped a little, so that you'd understand the history. So here is an olive tree. The top of the tree begins to wither. What does that represent? The apostasy of Israel beginning with the golden calf right down to the time of Christ. And so it said we'll take some wild branches and we'll graft them in. What are the wild branches? They were the Christian Gentiles. They were the Christian Gentiles who were converted by Paul and the apostles. Meanwhile, they took some of the branches that were, and uh, some of the little sprouts that came up and, and put them over here in three different parts of the vineyard. Now, it doesn't identify them. We don't know which, where, where, exactly where all of those are. And um, then it says that for a while, uh, these pro this produced good fruit, this produced good fruit, this was producing a little better fruit, but this was producing mixed fruit. So we decided this was what? The Nephites and the Lamanites. It was divided over there. And this was such poor ground, but did it produce good fruit? Yes, great. And then it says that uh, all of a sudden the whole thing became corrupt. The whole upper tree became corrupt, even with the Christian Gentiles. And it had all kinds of different fruit. What does that represent? All the multiplicity of churches that grew out of the of the earlier kingdom. Then um, it says that the the master of the vineyard, who represents whom? Who's the master of the vineyard? The father. Who's the servant of the vineyard? Christ. Now you'll find a lot of commentaries on the Book of Mormon that identify the master as Christ and the servant as his various prophets. Does this fit? Now, see, I want you to know this doc this well enough so when you hear false doctrine taught or a distortion of these things taught, you'll immediately pick it up. Because a lot of these things get into our Sunday school classes and you're going to be challenged with your point of view. So be quick to give a reason for the faith that's within you. Know that you can spin back to your book which will demonstrate to you why they ha if they call the master the savior, then how come the Savior is helping with the dispensation, the fullness of times for the first time? You see, that doesn't fit the Savior's mission. He's always been in there giving dispensations. But the Master said, when you have the great last cleansing, I will help. For the first time, the Father came onto the earth in connection with the dispensation and helped with this dispensation and said to this boy Joseph, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now see, that. That's the, one of the main clues that this is talking about the Father. All right, now they start bringing these branches back into the tree, and they start burning these. Do they burn all of them? No, the Lord says, go very, clo very carefully with those Gentile Christians. Uh, work very gently with them, because there's a lot of good left in them. We'll just burn the worst. And notice that when, in the 18th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the, um, the Lord says... When you go out to preach the gospel, do not speak against any other denomination, only against the church of the devil, which means evil. Call evil by evil's name. Don't go out speaking against denominations. And so the Lord is gradually cleansing and strengthening that tree. Any questions now on that particular parable? Are you sure you understand it? Because you're definitely going to get some questions on it in your exam. Don't run away. We've got 30 seconds. Yeah, I'll release you. I'll dismiss you when it's time. Any questions? Fine. All right. Now you're dismissed.